What's up, NBA fans? What's up, all sports fans? What's up, NBA fans? What's up, all sports fans? What's up, NBA fans? What's up, all sports fans? This is JB right here for the Behind the Bench channel, the Behind the Bench show. I just want to drop this video real quick. <clears throat> I want to shed light on something. It really gets discussed, if at all. I believe it's pertinent. And honestly, I believe it should be a cause for concern. When it comes to the NBA, it's all sports, professional sports, team sports. Competition is traditionally why we always tune in. We always want to see who's the best of the best, as they say, the cream of the crop. Without any unfair advantages, that take place to help anyone achieve victory, especially when it comes to championships. I wanted to shed light on something. I've been watching the NBA for a very long time, over four decades. And the stuff that I've seen go down over the past decade or so, I never would imagine, imagine, never even dreamed about this stuff going down, but it has. But it makes you wonder why. Well, it depends on what player you're referring to. Most superstars have to go out there and compete. Most of them do. But certain superstars in particular, there's one superstar who's been in the league for 20 years I've seen him be given the courtesy of one advantage after the next in pursuit of victory, even when his approach to victory is counterproductive and leads to a lot of unforeseen challenges that franchises that he plays for would not have to encounter and be faced with otherwise. And the player I'm talking about is none other than LeBron James. And I want to highlight the comparisons between what turned out to be his last year during his second run with the Cleveland Cavaliers, the 2017-2018 season, and what's going on now while he's playing for the Los Angeles Lakers during the 22-2023 NBA campaign. Now, as we remember, during the 2017-2018 season, coming off a, a final setback to the Golden State Warriors, where Cleveland Cavaliers lost to the Golden State Warriors in five games, that all season we saw an overhaul where Cleveland brought in Dwayne Wade who had just completed a season plan for the Chicago Bulls. They brought in Derrick Rose, who had, who had previously had been playing for the New York Knicks. Then they brought in additional uh, veteran players, such as uh, the Jay Crowders of the world, Jeff Greens of the world. And remember, they traded Kyrie Irving, who had requested a trade, to the Boston Celtics for Isaiah Thomas. Now, mind you, he was coming off of a uh, hip injury, but Isaiah Thomas had completed the best season of his career, averaging 29 points a game. So when those moves were made, the common thought, according to the experts, according to the pundits, they said that Cleveland team entering that season was better and deeper than the team that had just played Golden State in the finals months earlier so the season starts and immediately we see problems chemistry issues players assigned to the starting lineup that didn't jail there's eventually relegated to the second unit you saw a lot of, of inconsistent play and by midseason the team fell flat 
where you can tell that that team wasn't going to win anything. So by midseason, we saw something that had never been seen before in basketball history, not even with an expansion franchise. We saw a brand new squad, an overhaul, not a trade, an overhaul that took place that involved three teams where Dwayne Wade was traded, Derrick Rose was traded, Jay Crowder was traded, Isaiah Thomas was traded. Even Channing Fry, who was on the team the previous two seasons, he was traded. And in return, Cleveland received an infusion of young talent that prior to they was considered unsung or average at best. But when they got these players, Jordan Clarkson and Larry Nance Jr. from the Lakers, Rodney Hood, and who was it? Oh, George Hill, veteran George Hill. Then all of a sudden, the talk was, oh, this team is deeper, more athletic. They can compete for the championship. They'll definitely come out the East because at the time, Boston was in first place in the East. Now, I remember that first game with that new revamped squad, Cleveland blew Boston out in Beantown. And I'm sitting there stunned, like, how in the world can a team pull off a move to overhaul his roster midseason? Because normally, when it comes to trades, when you look back on it, during the offseason, when you make a trade, that's usually for someone who can come in and improve the team by taking over one starting position. Normally, midseason, teams make a tweak to their lineup and they'll bring in someone, but normally it's as a reserve type player, a six man type player. But we saw a team get a overhaul. Never been done before. But within weeks, the team started to curtail and the momentum from that trade started to wane out. But what carried Cleveland throughout the playoffs was they'll tell you primarily because of LeBron James, but really when you get down to it, the Eastern Conference was as lackluster at any time that we had witnessed over this past decade. This was before Giannis Antetokounmpo and the Milwaukee Bucks started to ascend to the top. It was just getting started. You had a young Boston Celtic team who had just lost Isaiah Thomas in a trade. So you have Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, like rookies and second-year players. Now, you had some good veterans on their team, but nonetheless, there were no superstars. Indiana Pacers, who Cleveland faced in the first round, had just traded Paul George to, to the Oklahoma City Thunder. In return, they, they acquired uh, Victor Oladipo. This was before he started suffering the uh, knee injuries. Now, good player, but no superstar, no all-star. He was most improved player. Cleveland struggled versus that team, and it wound up being a seven-game uh, series where Cleveland did prevail and advanced to the next round against Toronto. Toronto lacked a superstar, and his best player never could take his game and what he did in the regular season to translate to playoff basketball. And Cleveland won that series in four games. Then, of course, in the conference finals versus the Boston Celtics, Kyrie Irving missed that game seven, and Cleveland won and went to the finals. But you have to ask yourself, have we ever seen a superstar be given that type of help and courtesy midseason where essentially – they receive a brand new team. I would say the answer is no. I've never seen a precedent like that. Now, let's fast forward to the Los Angeles Lakers. This is a team. Now, mind you, and I'm going to explain why Cleveland had to make that move 
And the Los Angeles Lakers, why they eventually had to make that similar type of move. Okay. So you start the season off 0-5. Then 2-10. and 10. The pressure mounts. The tensions flare. People want answers, but there's more questions in the forefront and in the background. And you ask yourself, why did Cleveland fall to the way they did after three years of giving LeBron James everything he wanted when he returned back? And why did the Lakers continue to falter after the previous three or four years the Lakers gave LeBron everything that he wanted and then some? I would say it's because of the formula itself. But let's review what happened to the Lakers. So you start the season on five and two and ten. And you can clearly see for the second straight year that the Lakers were in, in a situation where, where they would not be able to advance to the plan, much less to the playoffs. Because remember, last year, the Lakers didn't make the playoffs. And then midseason, almost carbon copy to what happened in Cleveland five years earlier. Now, mind you, that was a three-team trade. Now, with the Lakers, they execute, well, an infusion of talent was redirected to the Lakers in a four-team trade. In a four-team trade that primarily consisted of players from the Utah Jazz, who the Lakers had just completed a trade for during the offseason that involved Taylor Horton Tucker and Stanley Johnson to the Jazz for Patrick Beverly, who wound up being traded five months later down the road. So yet again, LeBron James is given a brand new squad midseason. But for the Lakers situation, it was more pressing because for the past four years, they've mortgaged everything away to embrace this win-now scenario that's leading them to give up more and more, kicking the can down the road. Similar circumstance happened to Cleveland, but not even to the degree that's happening now in L.A. Well, L.A. Lakers, I should say. So they get this infusion of talent, and in return for trading Russell Westbrook in a first-round pick. They get two players from Utah, Jared Vanderbilt, Malik Beasley, and then Mike Conley of the Jazz is traded to the Minnesota Timberwolves, and then D'Angelo Russell is traded to the Los Angeles Lakers. But the buck don't stop there. The Lakers trade Kendrick Dunn, who, had, who they just signed prior to the 21-22 season. They trade him to the Washington Wizards and three second-round picks to get Rui Huchumaro. To recoup those second-round picks, because normally you don't give up three second round picks to acquire a player who's basically rotational, not even a starter. To recoup those picks, they traded Thomas Bryant to Denver in exchange for three second round picks. But what's crazy to me is Thomas Bryant, before the Lakers received an infusion of, of players, Thomas Bryant and his contribution to the team will now go unnoticed and unappreciated. But his play, his hustle, his energy, his competitive fire helped save the Lakers season when they were struggling. But when you're in this win-out scenario 
And when you look at the situation for what it is, when this dude is on your team, when LeBron's on your team, you're going to make moves that you normally would never even think about making. And when I, when I say not dream about making, I'm talking on a year-to-year basis. I'm not even talking about three to four years. I'm talking about yearly. And in some cases, twice a season. So you ask yourself, man, this is not a trade. This is, a re- this is an infusion, an overhaul. And you got to sit there and say, how can a GM alone execute this type of move where you're getting a total overhaul. And in both situations, Cleveland got an infusion of young talent. The Lakers got an infusion of young talent. And you know why? It's because they mortgaged and traded away the young talent who they drafted. But when you do that, no matter who you bring in to replace them, even if if it's multiple superstars, or all store where your talent pool is going to be exhausted and your roster is going to start to, to falter. So what happens is before you get the youth infusion, more than likely you have to rely on either low tier talent or veteran players. But the problem is a lot of these veteran players that LeBron has relied on over these past 10 years, They've gotten older. And a lot of them are either at the very end of their career, retired, or no longer in the league. You see, so the formula is flawed from the beginning because you're not supposed to be mortgaging off your young talent who you drafted, much less an entire drafted roster, that the Lakers were led to do to bring in multiple superstars over these past four years. They brought in two superstars in two calendar years. That's never seen before. You don't see that. I can see a team making a major trade every four years, every five years. He got them in Cleveland operating within the season to make moves. So what I'm saying is, in both instances, see, for our practical purposes, the manner in which he pushes teams to create rosters for him, stack rosters, is not normal to begin with. It's extreme in nature. And in the end, you wind up losing more than you win. What I mean, losing more than you win, not getting the desired result that you're told going when now can produce. And to show proof of that, this year for the Lakers, no, just just to say the playoffs in general, every team that advanced to the playoffs did so with at least 90%, let's say 85% of the roster that they start the season with. Like I say, Teams make a tweak here and there during the trade deadline. They bring it. They bring in a veteran player or someone uh, off waivers, you know, um, who can be an upgrade to the second unit. That's no big deal. But when you overhaul a roster, what I'm trying to say is a GM alone cannot do that. It has to be an additional. support behind the scenes to make these moves happen to this degree. Just imagine it. Imagine a football team, imagine the NFL team overhauling his roster midseason. Imagine a football, that's a 45-man roster. We're talking about 20-some new players being added to a team midseason. That's the equivalent of what's going on when this guy's on your team. We never see, and the reason why this happens, because these basketball commentaries or commentators, these basketball voices, 
the talking heads and these pundits always lobby for this guy to get the help, all the help. They don't do this for Kevin Durant. They don't do this for Giannis. Giannis just lost in the first round, right? They're not saying what he need for next year. They're not saying that. They tell him to figure it out and improve in certain aspects of his game, which I understand. But when it comes to LBJ, they don't do that. If it don't work, you're going to get traded. Or you're going to be waived or some to that degree. You won't be on the team for long. Even if you just signed, you can play one year, and if it don't work, you will be traded. And we've seen it over the past three years. But you have to get the infusion because all your drafted talent is gone. Now think about it. When they made those moves in Cleveland, now LeBron James was originally drafted by Cleveland in 2003, but he returned back as a free agent. But when they traded, when they traded all uh, Kyrie Irving, well, at that point, remember, they traded Andrew Wiggins practically on draft night to acquire Kevin Love. So by the time that 2017-2018 season started, they had no drafted players on the roster. You can't run a franchise like that. You can't do that. So at that point, you're like ad-libbing. It's like you're riding shotgun almost. Now, same thing happened to the Lakers. By the time the 21-22 season, now, mind you, Austin Reeves, who I like as a player, I really like the way he played. He's a tough player. But even he was undrafted. So by the time last year started, you really only had one drafted player on the team who was Taylor Hall and Tucker, who they had just re-signed uh, with an extension. But one year after that extension, he was traded to Utah. So now you really have no drafted players on the team outside of a young man who they drafted in the second round, Matt Christie. But when you're 19 years old, of course, you're just starting off and you're not going to get a lot of playing time, especially, you know, if your team advanced to the playoffs. It's so abnormal that you can't fathom a situation where you have no drafted players on the team representing the franchise. That's unheard of. And that's pretty much what happened to Cleveland in 2018 and what's going on with the Lakers now. Now, I remember what happened to Cleveland when LeBron left. They had nothing left. Luxury tax challenges up the chimney. And the franchise essentially crushed under the might of the previous four years. And really the only thing that helped uplift them was benefiting from that James Harden trade that involved four teams, which Cleveland was one of those teams where they got some good young talent in return and some draft picks to start drafting players of their own. Now they're doing pretty good. They went to the playoffs this year. They acquired uh, Donovan Mitchell in the trade. And they got a nice little future for itself. But it begs you the question, what's going to happen to the Los Angeles Lakers when all this is over? They've given up way more than Cleveland did and Miami did combined. But mind you, again, both teams had to receive an infusion of young players to sustain their roster and to be able to compete in this league. Because everybody else who made the playoffs and was competitive was able to do so with 90%, 85-90% of their roster throughout the course of the season. Because remember, prior to that trade, if I'm not mistaken, Oklahoma City Thunder, the upstore Oklahoma City Thunder with young players was higher in the standings than the Lakers were. So what I'm saying is this. 
that talent that the Lakers gave up over the past four years, when you look at what they're doing, the Randalls, the Brandon Ingrams, the Josh Hart's, the Avica Zubats, the Jordan Clarksons, the Larry Nash Juniors, the Kyle Kuzmas, the uh, Lonzo Ball, even before he got hurt, when he helped Chicago Bulls uh, reach uh, number one seed in the East the first two, three months of that 21-22 season before he got injured. The Lakers actually gave up on the best young core in the history of the NBA in the one-and-done era. Look at what they're all doing. There's not one bust. There's not one bust. Now, Cleveland drafted an Andrew Wiggins with the number one pick, and we never saw the number one pick of the NBA uh, draft traded right after he just got drafted. Now, imagine where he could be if he was able to grow and develop in Cleveland. Probably he's better than what he is now, and he wound up winning a championship with the Golden State Warriors last year, so he's an NBA champion now. So my point is this. LeBron James has received more help than any other superstar in the history of this league before, and I'm sure once he's no longer playing in the NBA, we'll never see another superstar receive this type of help. That's what I'm trying to say. All these other superstars traditionally, yes, they may have had another star play with them, but they was drafted to those teams and they had to build that together. You know, they'll talk about Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen, but Scottie Pippen played his whole career with the Bulls up until 98 when he uh, did a sign and trade with Houston. But he played with that team for 10, 11 years, and him and Jordan grew that together and became six-time champions. And he had to go through a lot of challenges to get to that point, so nothing was given to them. And when the Bulls were winning those championships, they won they went over on their roster. They weren't even conducting a lot of trades. They didn't need to. They had Michael Jordan on their team. So at the end of the day, I just want to throw it out there, man. I've never seen nothing like it. And it just stuns me that a player continues to get this level of help. When they, they don't lobby for these other players to get this type of help. So I just want to throw it out there. Again, the NBA playoffs is well underway. We're in the second round, conference semifinals. And uh, I, I believe the NBA needs to address a lot of stuff. Because what happens is, to me, teams that's building the right way, that's truly building the right way, and out there competing, they get penalized when a guy continues to benefit from concessions and, and, and infusions of talent every year to keep his so-called streak or appearing in the finals intact. To me, it undermines competition and it, it undermines the struggles that superstars from the past and even now have to endure 